Salutations, my name is Kevin Garcia. I am a professional comic book historian. I have actually been paid to read comic books. I was a researcher for Marvel for about 10 years, um, which is, well, fun to say. <laughs> um, but uh, basically my job was to go through Marvel history and try to make it make sense. Uh, well, not my job by myself. I was part of a very large team of professionals. Um, and uh, I have a confession to make before I get started, and that is I enjoy anime but I am not the largest anime fan. So I'm going to ask you guys here to help me out when I put something up there. You tell me who these things are and what they actually mean, because I know that you guys all know these things better than I do, right? But I'm gonna try to make some connections here that maybe you uh, weren't thinking about. So let's start at the beginning. All right, who is the godfather of anime? Osama. All right, so that one I knew, all right? So Astro Boy and Osama Suzuka's early stuff was just, you know, that is the foundation. Obviously there had been Animations prior to that, there had been propaganda stuff in the war, there had been stuff going back to the, the 20s, uh, there had also been, been manga, I mean, I mean comics, of however you would call it, they weren't maybe the manga we think of today, but Osama Tezuka, you know, really revolutionized it. And of course, I'm sure you guys all know that he was inspired by an American. What American really inspired him the most? Disney. Ah, see, well, okay, so Disney, I thought I was expecting Disney, but actually a guy that worked for Disney, Carl Barks. He's the guy that created, uh, anybody ever watched DuckTales? Yes. That was 99% Carl Barks. Basically, he uh, was part of the comic book division of Disney back in the 50s and 60s, and, and he just kind of went wild with the ducks. Uh, he made Scrooge McDuck a household name eventually. He gave this whole like genealogy to the duck family, so you could actually trace all of Donald's relatives in every direction, and all kinds of crazy stuff. But he also had this really vibrant, lived-in world, but even though it was cartoony, it still felt real, and Osama Tezuka just ate this stuff up. He loved it. So we'd see Carl Barks' um, comics, where they would have like really dynamic motion and, and, and life in every single panel, and he would kind of emulate that idea, but with his own original characters. Uh, he was so inspired by this, he would even do comic strips about his characters meeting Donald Duck and stuff, because he just thought it was the greatest thing. He even sent uh, Carl Barks a Merry Christmas card once, and I just have to wonder if Carl Barks had any idea who this person was that was sending him a letter from Japan. And, and I, I honestly don't know the history behind that, but I just kind of wonder, you know, did he realize how big of a deal that was? That the godfather of anime was basically saying, thank you for inspiring me. So I think that's pretty cool. But of course, Osama Tezuka, he created a whole world of everything. So that's, you know, where we get to that. And that's kind of the purpose of this panel. Is I just want to look at not so much the, the publishing history, but the creative history, the back and forth exchange between Japan and America, primarily the comics, but also other things at that time. Uh, I'm going to do a similar panel tomorrow on China, so I'm just throwing that out there. Um, if I can finish this one a little bit early, I might show you guys a little prize, uh, a special thing that may, some of you have seen before, but still fun. Um, but, let's go. So that's the uh, fun, goofy comics. Let's look at the more serious stuff. Everybody know this one? Yes, The Mandalorian. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Lone Wolf and Cub is probably one of the most influential comics in the world, but not necessarily to the world of comics, because there have been so many movies and TV shows that have been about a big, tough killer taking care of a kid, uh, from The Professional to, uh, there was, uh, I can't remember, one several years ago where the guy kept eating carrots. But anyway, it's a bunch of weird stuff that we're always with killers and little kids, killers and babies, killers and kids, and um, it all traces back to Lone Wolf and Cub, which was just super, super iconic. However, even beyond the surface plot elements, there are the visuals. He was taking comics and using them to tell these really gritty, brutal stories, and that really inspired people like Frank Miller to do that kind of stuff in America, where he was really taking this stuff and, and applying it to American heroes, turning Wolverine into a serious badass, doing uh, Daredevil, turning him from a goofy, you know, kind of Batman knockoff into a really, really uh, emotional, uh, tragic figure. Uh, he even returned the favor years later, uh, when they were re-releasing Lone Wolf and Cub in the U.S. in English, uh, Frank Miller did a bunch of covers for it because he was just so inspired. By the way, as I go through this stuff, if anybody wants to throw in some comments or ask questions or whatever, just jump on in, I don't mind. My day, my day job is high school teacher, so I'm, I'm good with that. All right, now we got this guy. Anybody know Jack Kirby? All right, good. Last night I asked if anybody knew R. Crumb, and two people said yes. All right, so Jack Kirby is super important. He created 99% of Marvel. I know uh, people are going to say Stan Lee. Yes, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby worked together with a lot, but uh, Jack Kirby also created Captain America when Stan Lee was the coffee boy at age 17. So um, Jack Kirby had created a lot more there. But one of the things that was most him was his idea of these cosmic gods, these giant 
robots that were basically beings under themselves that were just one with the universe, which so many anime artists later would kind of pick up on and take off with, you know? Um, now, I'm not saying that this is a one-to-one, -one, of course, because giant robots have always been a big part of Japanese, uh, well, 20th century culture, I imagine. I'd have to do research. Is there any, you know, 19th century giant Japanese robots? Uh, Japanese robots, no, but uh, if you look uh, you, you, you go looking for, for a Japanese folklore, or a script is full of so many weird Definitely. fantasy fantastical creatures, you could probably find something. I'm sure you could, yeah. But, but definitely, I think, when I think of these robots having these cosmic levels, I think of Jack Kirby. Also, Jim Starlin, the guy that created most of what is in Variance of the Galaxy as well. So. Robot Carnival documents a wooden mecha. Oh yes, I've seen that one. The little, the, wait, 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 Robot Carnival first of all. It's a movie from roughly this time period of Akira. Okay. Made, made around the same time. Definitely want to check that one out. So. It's, Sorry, it's, it's, it's a compilation from a bunch of different. Uh, oh, okay, Tom, I thought you were talking about that. So one, one of the six or seven pieces of it is a giant mecha from the 19th century made of wood. Mm -hmm. See, that's all right, now we're talking, I like that. Uh, but still, this idea of these giant uh, technological space gods and this idea that it could uh, tie to, to a greater, deeper meaning was something that Jack Kirby was always trying to pursue. And even if his comics weren't always, the ones he wrote rather, were not always as successful as the ones he just drew, um, they definitely just made an impact on creators all over the place. And in fact, uh, this exchange goes both ways, of course, because while I've been showing some Japanese creators that are inspired by Americans, or a lot of Americans, and of course, inspired by Japanese. Um, Adam Warren, Ben Dunn, I'm sure you guys are fans of these guys, you've heard of them. Um, Joe Mad actually lives in this area, he's come to a lot of uh, to, uh, Austin area commons. Uh, Chris Bacciallo, uh, I haven't met him, so I'm not sure I pronounced his name properly. Um, but definitely, definitely great creators, but I want to go back to the characters for a second. All right. Sole survivor of his planet. <laughs> his parents were some of the best, best examples of his race. They put him into a space pod, put him off onto the river, sent him to Earth, where he could be more powerful than everybody else, found by a kindly elderly person, taken care of, taught with ways to be good, and then became an icon. Yeah. So um, Akira Toriyama, of course, created the best Superman ever, and that is Superman <laughs> in uh, Dr. Slump. Um, anybody familiar with this one? Anybody heard of Dr. Slump? Yes. yes. <laughs> so he shows up in a couple of the storylines uh, where he's just uh, this little uh, interesting guy in, uh, in glasses who takes them off and uh, puts on his red cape and uh, blue suit and just, uh, hmm, yeah, he's interesting. <laughs> just want to throw that out there because that's fun. Um, now, another confession, second confession. I am from the right generation to have been here with Pokemon and I've never played a Pokemon game. I don't have a good excuse. All my friends and my family members have lent me games over and over again, and just one reason or another, things came up where I never got around to playing it, and I just, I just never have. So um, that is one of my shames, and I, 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 I understand that this is wrong. Who's this? Gabra. Gabra. All right. Anybody know who he's based on? So. Um, Yuri Geller was a real person in the 70s, and he was uh, a, a psychic um, who would bend spoons with his mind and stuff, and also various other things that people later would not respect him as much for. But he guest starred in some Marvel comics, so he's technically canon for Marvel. He showed up in some Daredevil issues. Um, but he's the one that popularized the idea of bending spoons with your mind, uh, and it really became a thing after that. In fact, I think to the point that I, my understanding is he actually may have uh, sued or tried to sue. Uh, Pokemon for this because he believed that it was based on him exactly. You know. Well, I think the, the Japanese name for all these characters was like Blue or something like Sorry, that. Sorry, it was what? The, the Japanese name for those was actually based on his name. Was like literally, it's Yuri? Or something? Something. Yeah, I think so. I'd have to look it up. But that's, I, I, I believe that. Like I, I totally believe that. Alright, who's this one? Alright. Thunderbird. I, this is, when I say America, I'm usually talking about US, but of course this is from the Americas, so it definitely has that culture. How about this one? Wow. All right. Um, anybody know what this is based on? I've seen a lot of YouTube videos where they do cover this a lot, so I think it's pretty kind of cool. In 1955 in Kentucky, there was a family that claimed that these aliens were basically kind of besieging their house, and there were all these little weird creatures that had these like diamond-shaped eyes and they were, you know, large ears, and they really would go after things in the house. And it was just—it's just a funny, well, not for them, I'm sure, but an interesting, weird story. 
And um, for whatever reason, this kind of obscure piece of UFO history became a big part of Pokemon, so I don't know, go with it. Um, one thing I find really interesting, though, is when it goes the other direction, like obviously there have been a lot of Pokemon ripoffs over the years, but to me, one of the biggest missed opportunities is one of the, the most financially successful Pokemon ripoffs without realizing it. It's a story about a kid that gets a small little monster, uh, teaches it to be good, and, and uses it to fight other similar monsters, each with different colors and powers, and they travel around islands together, finding each of these monsters that are each numbered. You know what I'm talking about? Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> Why Disney hasn't capitalized on this, I don't know. Uh, years ago, I was working for a website doing video game reviews, and I, they, I just said, send me whatever game nobody else wants to review. So they sent me Lilo and Stitch 2, Hamsterville, ha Hamster, that evil hamster guy, Havoc. Um, and uh, it was just a, yeah, just, you know, point and shoot, uh, not point and shoot, it was a um, platformer, you know, with guns, and had a couple of neat little levels. But it was, a, it was a decent game, but all I could think was, as popular as Pokemon is, I've watched some episodes of the cartoon, and I gotta say, it doesn't have the best plot. But this has an amazing plot, but no gameplay. If they could just put those together, it'd be amazing. Disney could be making, well, they're already making money, so I guess I don't need that. But still, all right, another one I wanna ask you guys about. Who is the first magical girl? So we're talking about somebody who can magically go from being a normal looking person to transforming into a big transformation technique and, and get into a nice, colorful, maybe scantily clad costume and use accessories as weapons. I'm gonna go with Kitty Honey. Okay. What? Mickey Oh, what was it, Mickey? And then A and I and I know who you're talking about, but I can't get the name out. And Kitty Honey, I also know. Um, Mickey Momo? Is that the one? No, no. That's the other Yeah, Mickey Momo. I mentioned Mickey Momo in my own panel. Okay. Well, I, I only learned about her recently, but I really liked what I was listening about that one. But... Oh, oh, did, is that, is that, oh did you hear about her for me? No, I have a YouTube video. Oh, okay. I, all right. I, oh, sorry. Sorry, but, sorry uh, I apologize. It, 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 it takes me about an hour to get here from my house, so I didn't catch any earlier panel studies. But, <clears throat> first magical girl, transformation sequence, everything. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no? Yeah. I mean, she's got all the, the, the requisite tropes, it's all in there. Um, it, real quick, side story. Are you guys familiar with the story of how Wonder Woman was created? A couple of you guys are. So Wonder Woman was developed, um, the, the story they always told was that it was developed by a psychologist uh, William Marston, who believed that young women needed to have a role model to show that they could be as strong as any man and be independent and not need to worry about, uh, you know, the, this is the 40s when, you know, women should be in the kitchen and stuff like that. He's like, no, young ladies should have a better role model than that. Um, and so he designed Wonder Woman. Um, but uh, it is generally agreed now that he did not design her alone. He did it with his um, scientific partners, that being his wife and his girlfriend. They, they lived together. Um, and his girlfriend always wore bracelets, so go with that. Uh, but anyway, the point is though, regardless of their very interesting, oh, and they were also very into ropes and tying, so that kind of uh, also, <laughs> also ties into Wonder Woman. But anyway, the point is, regardless of the creation, it was still this iconic, iconic image. And I can't help but feel there's some inspiration going back and forth here, but of course, I say back and forth, because while uh, Mickey Momo and, and Sailor Moon and others, you know, really made it a thing in Japan, it of course came back to the States where everybody really, really wanted to do the same thing. Uh, I love that Iron Man has a transformation sequence. I just, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, on that note, I want to pause a minute to show you guys a short little video that I just, just find super, super uh, entertaining. And uh, if you've seen it before, no spoilers.
gotta say, a transformation sequence can make anyone look cool. <laughs> I mean, I'd react that way. I think we would all think that would be awesome. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, she seems to have accepted at this point. So I wanted to put that out there. Uh, now I want to touch base on another very, very popular character. Um, again, my anime knowledge especially with modern anime, not super strong, but I like a lot of the older stuff from the 80s. Um, you guys know this one, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, Project Eiko is a super, super powerful girl. She can leap tall buildings in a single bound. She can, uh, uh, you know, more powerful than a locomotive. She can withstand a bursting shell. She also wears these bracelets that are bulletproof. They show her parents, uh, this guy that's always reading the newspaper, uh, the uh, Daily Planet. Uh, and uh, her mom, who uh, loves wearing red and blue and white and yellow, and also constantly wears bracelets. Uh, so yeah, she is the child of Superman and Wonder Woman, which I just think is great. Um, what's really cool about the show is that in the, the movies and stuff in the 80s, she had this villain that was like a, a female student, uh, or, uh, you know, part of her group, that was the daughter of this rich inventor, and she would always have these giant robot suits. And according to Wikipedia, uh, she was based on uh, Iron Man, but I call BS on that because Iron Man was not important in the 80s. Nobody outside of Marvel readers really cared about him. Um, but you know who did wear a big metal suit and constantly fought a guy in a cape, and that was Lex Luthor. Um, I think her dad was basically Lex Luthor with hair, so there you go. Um, it, it makes more sense to Ken. I just don't get the Iron Man connection. If you watch it, you'll see what I mean. He's totally Lex Luthor. Anyway, going on. All right, first giant monster to get his own movie and attack the city. Who is that? King Kong. King Kong, of course yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, definitely that. And definitely inspired uh, Japan. But of course, Japan took this whole giant monster idea and just ran with it. Um, so, to, so much so that kaiju has become part of our language today, which I love. You know, um, but of course, we in the U.S. have been inspired back by them. So we would, you know, make things like Pacific Rim and, and uh, the Avengers fought a guy called American Kaiju, and basically he transforms into a, you know, a kaiju, uh, and he yells out, USA! <laughs> and what's great is when the Avengers had to fight him, they got their own giant mech called the Avenger 1. Oh no, I think it's called the Avenger 5, actually. But anyway, giant mech. Um, by the way, a little side story, since part of what I did was research Marvel history, Godzilla, the actual Godzilla who attacked Tokyo, is part of Marvel canon. He exists in the Marvel Universe. This is very important. Um, what happened is in the 80s, Marvel would license a lot of comics, and usually they get their own little side stories or whatever, but Godzilla, they placed firmly in the Marvel Universe. The team that was constantly trying to hunt him down, they were S.H.I.E.L.D., you know? And they'd have one issue where the fast forward show up and try to take him down, or, or Thor and the Avengers. And uh, one great storyline, he gets shrunk, and he's the first size of a rat and fights the New York City rats. Um, but then he fights the thing like at the same height and everything, so that's a lot of fun with it. Well, when the series ended, uh, they kept some of the villains that they created for that and had them show up in the Avengers. And one of the villains, Dr. Demonicus, fought the Avengers, and he was a monster maker. He would basically make his own kaiju. And he said that in one of the storylines, I have finally been able to capture and mutate my greatest adversary, and I've made him my own. And so you see this giant green dinosaur character that's got these spikes at it. Totally not Godzilla, but from the description of it, it's Godzilla. So Godzilla is canon in the Marvel Universe, you just can't call him that. Uh, so I just find that interesting. Speaking of the Marvel connection, though, um, I, I, I am not the biggest Power Rangers fan in the world, although I do have a friend, I was talking about before the panel, that is just super into Sentai uh, uh, and Tokusatsu, and I guess they're right? Tokusatsu? And also the Kamen Riders and stuff like that. He loves all these. So whenever I have a question, I go to him. But one of my stances is always that uh, these guys, the original Power Rangers, the Go Rangers, whatever you call them, the very first Ranger from Toei, the very first one they made, that was a young man who would pull on, a, get the suit suddenly, and, and be able to call down a giant mech and fight giant robots, was Spider Man. So I maintain that Spider Man was the first Power Ranger. All right. Now they did have some other stories that had 
um, you know, young people wearing suits and young people doing various things. But the first time that they put it all together, suit, giant mech, giant robots, was when they did the Spider-Man show that Stanley signed off on. So, um, Japanese Spider-Man is a thing. And <laughs> one of the last things I did working for Marvel, because I worked with them for about 10 years, was researching Spider-Man, Japanese Spider-Man specifically. I, I watched all 42 episodes. Now, they, they say 41 episodes plus the movie, but the movie is a 20-minute movie, so it's an episode. Um, so I watched all 42 episodes, I took 52 pages of notes, and I got to write one page that showed up in a book. So, that was, a, that was part of my life that there, just went all the way down. But, I now know everything about Japanese Spider-Man, so that's cool. <laughs> um, for example, you guys all know he has the traditional Spider-Man origin, of course, you know, in that a, uh, just like Peter Parker, he had a giant spaceship that crashed into a nearby mountain, um, which released a giant dinosaur monster, which uh, killed his father. Um, but then he, just like, you know, Peter Parker, he met a 500-year-old alien that had been living underground, you know, for years. Um, who, by the way, had a vehicle with Goodyear tires in feudal Japan, which I just love. Um, uh, and, and this old man, just like Peter Parker, injected him with his own blood so that he could get spider powers, you know? Okay, so what's really great about Japanese Spider-Man is his powers are similar but different from Peter Parker. So, based, I, cause when you do research with Marvel, everything has to be based on what you can actually see. You can't just make inferences. You can't say, well, Peter Parker can lift 10 tons, so it means this guy can lift 10 tons. He lifted a car in one episode, but it was difficult, so I, I put him in the two-ton range. Um, on the other hand, he has the most unique spider sense that I've ever seen. Peter Parker can sense when you're about to attack him, you know. Even if sometimes you are spying on him while he's changing, he'll sense that, you know. So the weird things that often weird things don't. But apparently not a banana thrown in his face, so not that. Um, this guy does not have that kind of spider sense. He cannot sense you attacking him. He can sense you attacking someone else. So if anyone else is in danger, he knows exactly where they are. So like in one episode, his girlfriend's been kidnapped, and he goes, two kilometers that way, she's being attacked, and he runs. You know, that is an amazing sense, you know? Plus, amazing other senses. Uh, there's one scene where the, the villains have hidden underneath the ground, and you see Spider-Man walking around, and they're like, nobody make a sound. Everyone knows Spider-Man can hear a pin drop from 500 feet away. I'm like, really, everybody knows that? Um, and he finds them via the echolocation, so that's cool. Um, but his, oh, also, another power. Um, Wolverine is a you know, healing factor. Spider-Man kind of does. Uh, he gets shot up and he heals them, but only if he has time to concentrate. So like, if he gets shot up like a machine gun, he'll be like, Ugh! and the bullets will pop out and the blood will you know, you know, heal itself up. But if he doesn't have time to concentrate, he will bleed out. So he has to actually think about healing. Um, but his suit also has cool powers. Uh, so for example, um, throughout most of the series, the villains, I'm spoiling it, I'm sorry, I know all of you want to watch this stuff. It's, it's interesting. The villains want to find out who Spider-Man is, and they capture him multiple times. But I always notice that one episode they capture him, and the next episode they'd be like, who is Spider-Man? And the next episode they capture him again. I'm like, you captured him, why not just take it off? And then finally, in one of the last episodes, they finally addressed that and showed why they couldn't do that. Um, they captured him, ripped off his mask, and another mask took his place. They ripped it off, another mask took his place. <laughs> so I was like, oh, so that's why. You know, that explains everything. That totally the plot hole sealed, you know? Um, he only has one web shooter, um, on, you know, he can shoot out stuff like that, but uh, it also has other features, like it can detect aliens and let him, a kill at you and go like, human, oh, you're not human, you know, so that's kind of cool. Um, he can call down his flying race car with machine guns in it, which everyone knows Peter Parker had as well. Um, there's a famous skit of him like firing machine guns, everybody's like, oh, he's more bloodthirsty than Peter Parker. He is willing to kill, but he's very conflicted about it. He's not like Peter Parker where you never kill, but he is definitely not willing to kill unless he has to. So if you watch that scene where he's pulling out the machine gun and blasting everybody, he's not blasting anybody. He tells the villains, get down if you don't want to die, and then he destroys their equipment. So, you know, not that bloodthirsty. Anyway, this isn't the end of it, because while uh, Japanese Spider-Man came out in, uh, oh, I'll make a list for myself here. So in 1975, they made the first Go-Ranger, but it didn't begin to have giant robots. Uh, 1977, they made uh, Denki Kitai. I'm sorry, my Japanese is non existent. 1978, Spider Man. That was jointly owned by Marvel, and in fact, Toei has apparently given the rights to Marvel because Japanese Spider Man is now canon in the Marvel Universe. He has crossed dimensions and met Peter Parker. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but the following year, they made another Marvel series called Battle Fever J, um, and that one featured 
Well, it was initially supposed to be kind of a Captain America story, but it evolved, so there's no Captain America there anymore. Um, but each of these characters was representative of their own country. Uh, so representing America was Miss America, which everybody's like, aha, they, they, they gender bent Captain America. Well, there was already a Miss America in Marvel. I talked about her in a battle last night. So this, oh, mouse is probably there, is it? Laser pointer. Miss America. She could fly, super strong, through her mission, all that good stuff. Anyway, so they brought her in, and she's the blonde one, also the only woman. Uh, there's also Captain Japan and, and, uh, and a couple others. What I think is really interesting is um, for Russia, they don't have Captain Russia. So he, or not sorry, not Captain, Battle, Battle Japan, Battle Russia. So not Battle Russia though, he's Battle Cossack. So go with it. The, the, one that, the one that really doesn't age well though is that, um, well, Miss America is played by Japanese actors, of course, so she's Japanese but meant to be American, that's fine, it totally makes sense. One of them is called Battle Africa, and played by a Japanese guy. Not in makeup, thankfully, but whenever he is not in costume, he is pretty much wearing a caveman outfit and eating like from giant drumsticks and talking to animals, because I guess that's what people in Africa do. <laughs> anyway, they followed that up with, uh, with another, uh, another Japanese, uh, another toy Marvel combination called uh, Sun, uh, Sun Vulcan. That one I think is really neat because it actually had an eye patch wearing a secret agent that would tell the team, uh, give, uh, give them directions, so that's kind of neat. But anyway, all technically part of Marvel, and this was the formative years of the company that would later make what we in America call Power Rangers, so that's why I kind of say Marvel has its hand in that. That wasn't the only thing they did for Marvel, though, because aside from their live action shows, they also made Marvel's very first anime, Tomb of Dracula. Have you ever heard of that? So Marvel uh, realized two things. Number one, Dracula's public domain, so you can do whatever you want them. And number two, if they published books in black and white, they could have more blood in it, because at the time they weren't allowed to have vampires and things like that. So they made this uh, Dracula book, and they, they had a little storyline to go along with it. It was, even though they had free reign on ratings, they didn't do any R-rated stuff, it's more of just kind of piece of routine. And they said it to Japan and said, make a movie out of this, so they did. And it is, uh, it's amazing. To know the bent mortal enemy, you're no longer my son, Jadis. You're right, it will make it much easier for me to destroy you if I forget you were my father. It would not be wise for you to understand me to my totally wrong, so for accurate. I shall show you how I have managed to survive for 500 years! Oh, it sucks when your son has sun powers. Um, <laughs> So a lot of people think of Marvel's first movie as being Howard the Duck, um, unless you want to count uh, Spider-Man ones that were kind of repackaged from TV to show. But this one was actually, you know, a film for Japan, and it's, you know, first anime, first movie, kind of predates it. Um, this one I just learned about yesterday, I went to the Rumiko panel, and I, I enjoyed what I, what I watched, but there was one thing that just perked up my attention. Uh, this is more of a coincidence than anything else, because I, I don't think this is actually connected. But uh, the, uh, what, is, uh, what is your name, the creator of Yasha? Rumiko Takahashi. So she created this one called One Pound Gospel about a boxer and a nun, and there's romantic feelings involved, but you know, it really can't work out. And the thing is, when I was listening to them describe it, that's Daredevil's parents. You know, Daredevil's dad was a boxer, and the mom was a nun. And the reason I really kind of perked up my ears is because that was 1987, and that was introduced in 1986. So that has to be a coincidence, but I just, I liked it. I kept looking up to see if there was maybe some other pop culture nun boxer storyline that was in a movie or something around that time period. I couldn't find one, but you know, neat coincidence. But there are things that are coincidences, and there are things that are not coincidences. So let's get into those. <laughs> yeah. So, if you had to tie him to a superhero, who would it be? Yeah, super strong, invincible. I mean, does he fly really? No. Yes. I mean, kind of. I'm not sure, he does fly. He does fly. All right, so he flies. Does fly. It just, again, if you exercise enough, you can fly. Uh, so that works out. But honestly, this whole cast is definitely based on the various superheroes. Uh, for example, who's this guy? And he's based on basically Spider-Man. Obviously, he doesn't have the powers of Spider-Man, and he's obviously based on the common writer, you know, characters that are throughout the Japanese TV history. But personality-wise, he's that, you know, hard luck hero who would never give up, even if he's outgunned and everything else. Then we got this guy. Um, I am not going to tie him to Aquaman because I don't like Aquaman, but I will tie him to the original uh, Batman superhero who has a similar fashion sense, to be fair. Um, and then uh, these guys genetically created duplicates and everything like that. And he's definitely not 
plenty of those. Uh, super powerful psychic that is dangerous and easily angered, and that, you know, there's a lot of connections there. You can see that, right? It's, it works out, right? And this is definitely purposeful. And he also goes, I, by the way, I haven't watched any of season two yet, but it's really good. Is this true? No. Okay. All right. is kind of in a place right now. Yeah. Okay. I've heard. Yeah. Um, so we got this guy. Um, he, he could be generic any superhero, but the thing is, Mad Drake the Magician was just a big part of comic book history of being like the proto Doctor Strange or Doctor Fate kind of character, and, and a lot of other characters were based after him with the hat. Uh, there's also this character who I know nothing about from the comic, but as soon as I saw it, I said, I know who that is, and that's, you know, Matter Eater Bad, who is an actual DC superhero whose power is he can eat anything, so that's cool. And then we got this guy, who is a Marvel superhero. <laughs> that's pretty one-to-one. -one. Uh, honestly, you can go, you go through at least the few random uh, uh, pages that I went through of One Punch Man and watching the whole first season. There's just so many characters that just clearly are, you know, one-to-one, -one, or at least definitely inspired by some American ones. Um, here I can see, like, there's a Captain Cold in there. The guy with the pointy hat is Hate Monger, who is a Marvel villain that is actually Hitler. That is a thing. Basically, Hitler's body died, but he sent his mind to a clone body, and now he fights the Nazi War. Go with it. Um, but then, of course, we have the other really great superhero story. One thing I love about One Punch Man and Hero Academia is that, um, I, again, as a fan of American comics, I love this idea of seeing how Japanese creators are basically saying this is American comics through the lens of their creations. Uh, so it's basically how they, like, you can see Big Hero 6 as being like American creators saying, here's what Japanese things are like. Well, this is kind of the other direction, so it works really well. Um, Hero Academia just follows from a long tradition of American comics that have schools teaching kids to be superheroes. You know, and a lot of the heroes are again one to one with uh, you know your main character. You have this again Spider-Man connection of this hard on his luck, easily beat up. Here's the one that gets me though, All Might. Who would you tie him to? Superman. See, a lot of people tell me Superman, and I disagree on that one because he is a scrawny guy that can magically transform into a big guy. Uh, he also never stops smiling, and he always squints. Which, if you look at the original Shazam, the original Captain Marvel, he always, he never had his eyes open, ever. Like, no matter what's happening, he's like, oh no, you know, but he's constantly smiling, constantly smiling, and that's him, you know, it works out really well. Uh, and then, of course, you got the idea of Golden Age superheroes, the idea that there were heroes from a previous generation that could still be around and help out, and the gritty ones that are going to be dark and mysterious, but have, oh, so much angst, you know, let's get the head to far. Uh, too much angst, and also torn clothing, because the 90s. Um, then you have the idea of the really cute animal heroes that are also powerful but friendly, but they wear a mask for some reason because to hide an identity or something. <laughs> um, here's another one. Um, a lot of people are telling me that this guy could be the thing, and I agree with that, but I feel like he's closer to this, um, <laughs> this early 90s indie hero called Concrete who was just this very quiet, peaceful man who just happened to look like a large stone monster. Um, you know, so to me there's a connection there. Um, this one, you can tie it to a lot of stuff. There's just so many, yep. so many, so many stuff. Yep. If you tie that to, I'm not going to bother with that one, but still. Um, again, so Frogman <laughs> and his son, Lee Frog, our characters from Marvel, started out as bad guys with the power to jump. That's it. Um, but then they wanted to be heroes, to be good guys. They would try, and they are generally seen as the worst heroes ever, but you know, go with it. They're trying to be good. Um, this is pretty obvious, right? Her name was even Invisible Girl, so that worked out. Uh, Sue Richards has been called Invisible Girl since the 80s, but she used to be always called Invisible Girl. She's a boy. Of course, the guy that transformed his body into living steel, so that works out. What's his power? Mind control. Yeah, mind control. He doesn't just make you do things. What's he make you do? At least in the episode I saw, maybe it's different in the comics, but in the manga. But in the episode I saw, he just made them both still, right? Like he didn't actually make them do something he didn't want to do, he just could not move. Is that correct? Well, that's Karma, who's one of the new mutants. That's, that's exactly her power. Um, and then we got Best Genius here, who is also based on a Marvel character. His power is to control clothing with red. And, so that, and there is literally a character. Uh, her name is, it used to be Gypsy Moth, but now she goes by the less racially sensitive Skeen. Um, and her power is just literally she controls clothing. So much so that she wants to defeat Spider Man by making all of his clothing disappear. So he could have made a webbing mask and webbing underwear and ran away. Uh, so she's pretty powerful. 
doesn't really do much with her powers, but you know, she makes Spider-Man naked. <laughs> uh, she's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of growing superheroes, but the first one I thought of in terms of female giant was, was her. Um, now the thing is, is that a lot of people will tell me, well, this could be a coincidence. Like I said earlier, the whole uh, boxer nun thing is definitely a coincidence. Um, However, this is not the case because the creator of One and the creator of uh, One Punch Man are both really, really big American comics fans, and they've said so repeatedly. Um, these are all from um, Koihei Horikoshi. Is that right? I, I would say. Okay, um, but they're all. He posts them on Twitter. He just he is a humongous fan of Marvel comics. He reads them all the time. So I fully believe Best Genius was inspired by that. I mean, he's never said it directly, but to me, it like stands. It stands for reason. Um, with that, I want to kind of wrap this up a little bit because I want to show you guys something at the end. <clears throat> my name is Kevin Garcia. If you ever want to look me up, I have a very hard to remember website if you can remember my name. <laughs> I also have a blog that I never update because no one pays me to update it. Um, but I post things whenever I can. So with that, uh, any questions about uh, comic book history or especially the American comics or anything else, manga or anime related that I may have thrown up here? All right, well, what's up? Have you ever seen any of Tiger and Bunny? Tiger and Bunny. Oh, that's actually in my notes, Tiger and Bunny. I watched an episode, I couldn't really get into it, but everybody could tell me I would love it. Yeah. I probably will if I watch more of it. But the series of American, the love for American comic books. Definitely, yes, that's everybody keeps telling me. Well, one big thing I saw about it when I did watch it was the idea that they were corporate superheroes, where they were kind of like being publicly sponsored. The more they do to save, the more that they, um, the more the credit they get, you know, right? And there's actually several Marvel, not Marvel, several American superheroes that have had that kind of same origin. Um, Wonder Man from the Avengers, he splits his time from being a Hollywood movie star and also being a superhero, and usually he will only get his Hollywood gigs because if he does something really famous when he saves things, we'll be like, all right, we'll put you in the movie. Um, and then um, there was a team called Youngblood from Image, where their whole big thing was that they were celebrity superheroes. Marvel made one later on called Ecstatics, which was basically X-Men if they were celebrities. Um, so there's a lot of that idea of like, you're a superhero, but a corporate superhero. Probably one of the best ones to really run with that was the, the more modern versions of Booster Gold from DC, where he actually has like his sponsorships tied to his uh, costume. And you'll actually show like who's sponsoring him today, or go save the day, but you know, only if you get paid for it. So that's kind of cool. Uh, definitely Tiger and Bunny's one. I, I need to get more into it. Any others? All right. Well, um, thank you very much. That's the presentation. If you want to stay for a second, I want to show you some news.